Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Philip Phillips and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. I'm very pleased today to welcome everyone, our students and any other folks who may be watching us online um, to welcome you to our series on social justice. Uh, today, I'm going to invite Dr. John Vile, Dean of the University Honors College to introduce our speaker. Okay, thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Seku Franklin. Uh, several years, many years ago, actually, when I was chair of the political science department, we hired him as an assistant professor in the department, and he has since climbed to the rank of associate. In addition to other works, uh, Dr. Franklin is the author of a book by New York University Press entitled After the Rebellion, Black Youth, Social Movement, Activism, and the Post-Civil Rights Generation. And he has co-authored a book entitled Losing Power, African Americans and Racial Polarization in Tennessee Politics with the University of Georgia Press. Dr. Franklin is engaged extensively in social activism and has coordinated the Tennessee Election Protection Hotline and served as a member of the Tennessee Advisory Committee for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He has given a number of prior honors lectures and will be speaking today on the timely topic of African Americans and the fight for voter justice in the 21st century. Dr. Franklin. Okay, uh, thank you for having me. Well, let me see. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. And I'm going to, yes. Uh, yes, uh, let me start off by thanking um, the Honors College for inviting me to this important discussion. And I'm gonna just try to fix my, uh, my screen just a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, um, okay. Yes, let me start off by thanking the Honors College for inviting me to this important discussion. And I wanna give particular thanks to Dr. John Vial. He was my first uh, department chair and I greatly appreciate all the support that he's given me over the years, as well as Dr. Phillips and uh, Susan Lyons for organizing this discussion. Before getting started, I wanna say that uh, this discussion of voting, voter, voter justice, I use the term voter justice and voting rights interchangeably. Um, in some respects, I came to this topic by accident uh, one of my mentors, right before I came to MTSU, interestingly enough, um, had been working on voting rights dating back to the 1970s for uh, a now de uh, gr a group that's no longer in existence called the Southern Regional Council, which came out of the voter education project of the 1960s and 1970s. And through my association with him, I was able to deepen my understanding and perspective of voting rights. Uh, since then, I've been fortunate enough at MTSU to teach a voting rights course um, at times has been an EXL course. I've been able to take students to uh, places like Birmingham, Alabama, Miles County, Alabama, Selma, Alabama. But I also had the privilege to work with groups such as the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, and NACB LDF on voting rights and redistricting disputes or, or investigations. Um, and, uh, you know, to be kind of nerdy, so to speak, I do some work for. Um, for vote for on um, redistricting issues um, under the rubric of voting rights that's typically known as what's called ecological inference work. Um, I can probably go into that uh, maybe offline if anyone's interested in that. And I also do some work on redistricting issues. Um, so I want to just give a big shout out to that. So um, let me start off my argument um, by, by advancing an approach an approach or a framework that looks at voting rights and voter suppression, in the, particularly in the South and in the 21st century. And the argument that I'm going to make, I'm making, is that the struggle for voting rights is just as important today as it was in the 1960s, and really as it was in the, in the 19th century. And in some cases, it may be even more challenging, given given what I call the administrative and regulatory arrangements that are in charge of voting rights. And that is, much of the protection surrounding voting rights is negotiated and adjudicated vis-a-vis -vis administrative and political arrangements that many Americans give a little attention to. Local election commissions, secretaries of states, state boards of elections, city councils and county commissions, oversight and judiciary communities and state legislatures, private companies often in charge of voter verification, state courts, private actors, including attorneys who are constantly shopping for jurisdictions 
to challenge voting rights claims and the Department of Justice's voting section in the Civil Rights Division, which quite frankly has been weakened in, in the last decade or so. And this gets to the centerpiece of the challenge of dealing with voting rights and voter justice in the 21st century. And that is that voter suppression thrives best when it operates in what I call the submerged state, quote unquote, that I just described. Much of which entails a decision-making apparatus that is for the most part out of sight and out of mind until it rises to the level of, legal, of a legal challenge that galvanizes the larger public. The submerged state has been typically used to describe the management of social policies. It's a, it's a common term used in kind of social policy, policy literature, yet it also has relevance in this discussion of voter suppression. It suggests that there are existing policies, practices, and election laws that are largely invisible or out of sight, out of mind to ordinary people, but nonetheless are important in determining their ability, that is the ability of everyday people to have free and fair access to the voting booth. In fact, as many voting rights scholars have expressed, and I'm thinking, about a former professor here, Dr. Tyson King Meadows, who wrote an excellent book on voting rights, and Spencer Overton, who's at the Joint Center for Political Economic Studies. I'm thinking about his book as well, that as many voting rights scholars have expressed, few Americans understand the reach of the Voting Rights Act, its limits, its broader impact on our understanding of the constitutional protections. Um, despite the fact that the Voting Rights Act is probably the top one in the top five or top 10 of domestic policy achievements of the 20th century. And so let me illustrate two stories that pertain to Tennessee, one past, one present. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, the rural West Tennessee towns of Fayette and Haywood counties went through a brutal voting rights movement. It was called the Tent City Movement. In Fayette County, voting rights became an issue after a black man was wrongfully convicted for a crime, and at the time, blacks could not serve on juries, on juries which only allowed registered voters to vote in jury, in, in, on juries. Um, hence, the Black community mobilized in Fayette County and the neighboring county of Haywood. The mobilization had many admirers. Many of the uh, champions of what we call the Civil Rights Movement looked to the Tent City Movement as a model for organizing, particularly the members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And even the Justice Department of Justice came in to mediate the dispute. This is one of the most important uh, interventions that the Department of Justice made in the 1950s. Um, at the time, the Department of Justice had a newly created division, the Civil Rights Division, that came out of the 1957 Civil Rights Act. And although the act was seen as watered down and maybe perhaps not, not effective or ineffective, um, the voting rights activists were able to take advantage of this law. And the agency used their power to jumpstart investigations into Fayette County and the neighboring Hayward counties to look at voting rights abuses, all of which related back to this jury selection issue at the time. And they faced many reprisals, that is black, black voters faced many reprisals in West Tennessee in those two counties. Black sharecroppers were kicked off their land and forced to live in makeshift sh tents that was in those shanty towns, thus the title Tent City. Blacks were denied medical supplies, hospital care, gas at local stations, and in some cases food, perhaps more than any other voting rights, local voting rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s, there was a wholesale totalizing reprisal against the black community in these, in, in these particular counties. Um, and then something interesting happened. Local activists experienced a semi-victory. The Department of Justice brought a suit and local elected officials agreed to open their voter registration offices to black voters. Yet this is what happened next. And this gets into this idea of the submerged state. In the summer of 1960, hundreds of blacks tried to register to vote given this new consent decree that was in place. County officials, however, only allowed them to register on one day in the week, and that was on Wednesdays in the hot summer months. They were required to stand in a perfectly straight line. They could not sit or stand on the courthouse lawn. They were not allowed to use the bathroom, and the voter registration office, which was typically outside, was moved inside of the building. As Blacks stood in 90-degree weather, they were spit on, people poured coffee on them, and paint and red pepper poured down from the top of the courthouse on top of them. Now keep that in the back of your mind because here is another story. And this hits close to home and this is a more contemporary story, story, story. Right now, as we speak, lawmakers are currently proposing a bill that would allow state officials to use fingerprinting as a way to verify one's voter status. They would use essentially the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations fingerprint verification process. The proposed bill comes nearly two years after state lawmakers mailed it, made a failed attempt to criminalize organizations involved in voter registration efforts. That law would have required these groups to provide sworn statements that, will, that they will obey laws 
that they receive training from state election officials and to submit the names and contact information of the organization's officers that were engaged in voter registration drives. A federal judge came in and placed an injunction on the law and ultimately the Secretary of State backed down from fully challenging the injunction and ultimately that law failed. But what these cases illustrate is an important point about both past and contemporary voter suppression. In both cases, African-Americans faced attacks against their capacity to vote. In the 1960s, the attacks were propelled or augmented by an extreme variation of racial terrorism. Recently, however, the, the attacks on voting rights has not been violent, but it is also a reprisal campaign, one can argue, against Black-led voter registration groups and Black voters and other voters in the last two November elections, that is 2018 and 2020. In addition, these cases also underscore how anti-voting rights advocates, those advancing voter suppression uh, bills, have, both, have become asymmetric in their attacks on voting rights, that is shifting the terrain and playing field of, on which civil rights activists must fight on, and have been able to use more overt and visible forms of voter suppression, but also less overt, um, 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 less overt forms of voter suppression that operate primarily in this issue in this what's called submerged state process that I'm talking about. That is that they're able to embed voter suppression tactics in local election commissioners and the secretary of the state's office in rules and regulations that are more difficult for Americans to understand and are largely out of sight and out of mind. In the 1960s in Tennessee, Right. This process entailed changing voter registration procedures to undermine black voters and to circumvent the Justice Department to essentially wear the civil rights movement down. But today, this entails an attempt to change how voter registration activities take place, change how voter access is obtained, and change even how absentee ballots, as you'll see later on, are, taken, are, are, are carried out in order to force voters to deal with a complicated set of procedures that must be dictated, administered, and managed by local election commissions, district attorneys, election coordinators, and others. In other words, that is voter suppression operates best and most effective when it operates in this submerged state that I talked about. So how do we get here? I'll just give you just a, a, a brief run up, uh, uh, overview of, of voting rights advancements that have occurred really since the beginning of time. In the 1820s, we saw property tax restrictions being lifted or relaxed for white men. Um, we saw debates over free and emancipated blacks, um, even as even in, in the post 1820s, there were about 130 African Americans who could vote free free blacks that is who could vote in places like Tennessee in the 1830s. The 14th Amendment also represented a major advancement in, in, in access and equal protection. The 15th Amendment as well um, uh, gave African American men the right to vote. Then we saw the 19th Amendment that universalized women's suffrage for women. The 24th Amendment eliminated poll taxes in federal elections. There's another story there in which Tennessee and Alabama, interestingly enough, made an attempt, successful attempt, at least temporarily, to eliminate poll taxes for state and local elections in the 1940s. 20, and then the 26th Amendment gave young people the right to vote um, in the early 1970s. And then we saw the biggest and biggest and most significant advancements in voter protections in the 1960s with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Primarily those sections that are described as sections two and sections four and five. And then in 1970, we saw the advancement of giving young people the right to vote, later ratified by the 26th Amendment. 1975 gave non-English speakers, that is, not just people who spoke Spanish, but Native Americans who spoke indigenous languages um, as their first language, Chinese voters in New York City, um, uh, uh, Jewish Americans who maybe spoke Yiddish and others. We saw the Voting Rights Act extended in 1982. And then again, extended in 2006, and then we saw the National Voter Registration Act as well, right? So, um, but let me kind of lift up a controversial argument as we move forward and how do we get here in this period of time of contemporary voter suppression? And I think this rings true, um, although I, I admittedly, I may be drawing upon anecdotal information. And what I wanna just emphasize is that, think about this, at the height of the civil rights movement during this period of time right here, we had maximum attention Focus on voting rights. We had the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, led by Martin Luther King Jr., the Highlander Center here in Tennessee. Um, they had a citizenship education program that trained at least 10,000 activists in the South. The Voter Education Project 
registered tens of thousands of voters, freedom schools, farmer cooperatives, NACP voter registration drives post-World War II. And even before World War II, think about the civic leagues of which dozens were established dating back to the early 20th century. And the point that I wanna make is that the advancements that we made in voting rights in this period of time in the 1960s occurred because of maximum grassroots pressure, along with the fact that there were institutional allies in place, not just partisan-based allies, but a bipartisan coalition of institutional allies. Um, the Eisenhower administration, under that administration, you had the 57 and 1960 Voting Rights Act. Under Johnson, you had the 65 Voting Rights Act. So you had a bipartisan group of folks along with maximum pressure related to voting rights that also, uh, that also got the voting rights legislation passed. But undoubtedly, I would argue that the contemporary challenges facing voting rights has been shaped by significant changes in the political environment writ large. And this gets to an important um, argument that, I'm, that, that I think is important to look at. And that is that the attacks on voting rights have been adverse, adversely influenced, at least from my perspective, from a very narrow reading of the constitution and, and a conservative jurisprudence um, in, which, in which judges have raised a higher bar on how and what voting rights lawsuits can be brought. And the first wave of black voter participation after the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 African Americans and other groups faced a tremendous amount of backlash. In the 1970s, Frank Parker and others referenced the period of time as so-called the white backlash. Um, that saw the implementation of a number of voter dilution mechanisms that essentially attempted to create face neutral and race neutral barriers on black voter participation, a laws and practices that on the surface seemed to, seemed to be absent of racial animus, but in reality were intended to undermine the Voting Rights Act and to make it more difficult for African Americans in the South to exercise full participation. Undoubtedly, the goal of anti-voting rights activists was to shift the ideological framework of the federal courts. If you look at this, the most damaging court case that came about in the last decade or so, the Shelby County case, that is Shelby, Alabama, that was a case that was shopped around by judges that wanted to fundamentally change voting rights. Um, and so this shifting of the ideological framework in the federal courts um, has been done, has been carried out in order, in order to show that electoral laws and procedures that were explicitly racist or a consequence of smoking gun or vote counter racism, in order to show that those laws can also be reframed as face neutral laws that are objective, face neutral laws that essentially don't harm African Americans, but in reality, they do harm African Americans. Basically, the federal courts and those opposed to comprehensive voter, voter participation, I would argue, took the exact same position that those reconstruction or post-reconstruction court cases took. That is that they could, they could not eliminate voting rights laws in totality, but they could undermine it at different entry points. And of course, anyone who has even at, the, at a minimal level of participation in voter registration drives and election protection initiatives knows that there's a range of face neutral and race neutral and covert practices that have undermined black voting rights. Voting rights activists were well armed in the 1970s to counter this backlash. They engaged in an all out fight against this backlash. There was a fragile coalition, a bipartisan coalition at the national level that also protected voting rights, including dealing with face neutral procedures that had an adverse impact on African American voters. Further, by the mid 1970s, voting rights were no longer just about the so called black white encounter, but expanded to 18 year olds and non English speakers, as I mentioned earlier. And even continuing into the 1980s, voting rights advocates and congressional allies expanded voter protections to counter vote dilution. That is, they expanded voter protections to address face neutral or race neutral procedures or de facto procedures that had an impact adversely on the voting rights of minorities. And in essence, in the 1970s, the Voting Rights Coalition, though battered and bruised, was able to counter the backlash that occurred in response to the Voting Rights Act. And as a consequence, reauthorized that law several times in 1970, 1975, 1982, and again in 2006. Yet still today, we see modern variations of this backlash that has fueled voter suppression tactics. Again, mostly in the administration of voter protections in the submerged state, through state and local offices, through election laws that are largely obscure and invisible to everyday people. The 21st century of variations of voter suppression have accelerated partly in response to the growth of non-whites and the browning of America. That is the growth of non-whites and the browning of America, particularly in those competitive swing states. 
These voter suppression tactics include voter purges, strict voter registration laws, vote caging, and limits on voter registration, all of which I'll discuss later. Um, and it's not just the population growth of non-whites, but it's a non-white electorate. Those prospective voters over 18 years old, 18 years old and over. Think about this. If Obama runs in 1980, he loses the election. Why? Because 11% of the non-white electorate um, is 11 percent of the not, of the electorate is non-white. By 2008, the non-white electorate emerges to be 25 to 27 percent of the pop voting population. Furthermore, the growth of the non-white electorate comes at a time in which many black voters are returning to the South, and many many immigrants of New Americas now live in the South, from North Carolina, Carolina to Louisiana to Tennessee. The South now has the largest concentration of African Americans through reverse migration, somewhere near 60%. The growth of the non-white vote has produced a new 21st century variation of backlash, white backlash. In political science, we use fancy concepts such as racial resentment and racial animus and racial priming. There's a number of books and articles on that, but they fall in the same family as backlash. Um, and here I would also reference Tesla's work as well, as well as some of the, 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 the recent work by Bruce Bartlett on Tim Slim. So why does all this, this matter? It matters because it is increasingly harder to find sympathetic voices to support voting rights. And many Americans have been primed to think that voter suppression tactics are needed for election security and to protect the integrity of the ballot box from fraud and ineligible voters. Now, in many parts of the country, particularly in the South, there is a coalition, a supermajority coalition in state legislatures, um, often anchoring their arguments in racial resentment that is attacking voter voting rights. We've seen this in Alabama, we've seen this in Florida, we've seen this in Georgia, we've seen this in North Carolina, South Carolina, and in Tennessee. And in Tennessee, I've been involved in at least two voting rights cases in the last, or disputes in the last two years. What this coalition has done is that they've essentially penalized, that is this voter suppression coalition, they've tried to penalize voters, many of whom are disproportionately minorities and young people, as we've seen, as I'll talk about again, through voter, voter identification laws, voter purge laws, and restrictions on voter registration. One tactic that speaks to this issue of, of racial animus and backlash is the use of what's called racial priming, quote unquote. Uh, Racial priming is a use of negative messages, racial imagery, that is pamphlets, direct mail, television, radio advertisements, subtle racial appeals, and other indirect or subtle messages. So to what's called activate um, adverse racial de predispositions, predispositions among black voters, among voters rather. Between 1993 and 2007, 17 studies consisting of more than 5,000 subjects found that racial priming does racialize public opinion. It does so often without the direct awareness of the people who are the targets of priming tactics. In Tennessee, racial priming was exhibited in 2008 when a controversial mailer on the left-hand side of your screen was distributed throughout the second district of Tennessee that targeted Representative Nathan Vaughn. Many observers believe the Blackbird mailer, as it was called, was used to stimulate white racial resentment in that election. Vaughn actually lost that election by less than 350 votes. The most demonstrative use of racial priming in Tennessee occurred in the 2006 Senate race when Harold Ford attempted to become the first African-American elected as Senator in Tennessee. The watershed of the event of the election was the October 20th airing of a controversial political advertisement by his opponent that implied that Ford had a romantic ties or perhaps a sexual liaison with a white woman at a 2005 Super Bowl party. Many people believe that this was designed to mobilize white voters by using racial taboos. Other priming tactics included um, an online mailer, as you see right there, depicting Harold Ford as a, um, as a out of control rap artist, I guess. <laughs> um, a racially coded pamphlet distributed in East Tennessee, urging voters to vote, quote unquote, vote early to preserve your way of life. A radio commercial criticizing Ford with African drums beating in the background and other controversial um, tactics that were also used. And it's difficult to conclude whether Ford would have defeated his rival opponent without the use of racial priming in the election. I doubt that he would have won, but it did nonetheless inject racial priming into this race. And this is important for the Voting Rights Act, folks. I wanna emphasize this point. A testimony before the National Commission on Voting Rights in 2014, I argued that racial profiling, racial priming 
as a modern approach to fomenting white backlash should be adjudicated as a Voting Rights Act claim, particularly defined by the 1982 reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. That is, in that 1982 reauthorization provision of the Voting Rights Act, they did identify racial subtle appeals and racial priming as a, as a devastating component of voter suppression that must be challenged. So I think we have to look a little bit more closely to that. The third, another factor that has been without a doubt important in accelerating the pace of voter suppression was the Shelby County Beholder case in 2013. Um, this case, one can argue, delivered the most significant blow to voting rights in recent memory. It was Shelby County, Alabama, right outside of Birmingham, if anyone's interested. The law essentially eliminated sections four and five of the Voting Rights Act. The two components joined at the hip, that is sections four and five, created the preclearance provision that in very generic terms um, said that if you came from a jurisdiction that had a long and historical pattern of voter discrimination, any changes made to your election laws and procedures had to be approved by the federal government, specifically the Justice Department. And the, 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 the Shelby v. County v. Holder case did not apply to Tennessee because Tennessee was not what's called a quote unquote preclearance state. But I do think it set the tone um, across the country and essentially green lighting other attacks on the Voting Rights Act. Right now, currently the Supreme Court is adjudicating what's called section two of the Voting Rights Act that does apply to Tennessee in every single jurisdiction in this country. So this is what happened um, after Shelby Beholder. The Shelby Beholder case brought significant harm to black voters, Native American voters, and primarily Spanish speaking voters. Since the Supreme Court ruled on the case in 2013, nearly 1700 polls have closed in states covered by the preclearance provision. A number of states in the South, such as Alabama, but also in the Midwest and places like Pennsylvania and Ohio implemented the photo identification laws. This is not necessarily a new phenomenon that is photo, photo identification. It was implemented in Indiana years ago before the Shelby case. But what is new is that it narrowed, that is it gave states the opportunity to narrow what qualifies as a legitimate photo identification uh, card. In several parts of the country, voters needed a government issued ID, ID that was much more narrow, narrow than what they typically had been using. In Alabama, there was already a photo, photo identification law on the books but it was not enforced until the Shelby County case. And in that state, black and Latino voters were twice as likely as whites not to have a photo ID and an estimated 118,000 registered voters um, in those populations were affected by this. Overall, 11% of voting age citizens in 2016 did not have a government issued ID, which equated to 21 million prospective voters, 18% of whom were seniors, 25% of whom were African-Americans, and 50% of whom were low-income residents. They did not have a qualifiable government idea, ID that was identified in the new laws that were passed by the states. And the South, the, uh, South, the South was the most adverse hit by the new, new photo ID laws. Prospective voters in the South are three times more likely to not have a photo identification law. And this has been particularly used, I would argue, to suppress the vote of Native American voters, in part because what you found and what's called American Indian country was that a number of states or several states rather changed their residency requirements and required the photo ID law to be patterned after that. A residency require basically meant that if you've used a tribal identification, if you've had tribal identification for decades and you use your tribal identification card, and now they said you can't vote unless you have a non-tribal identification card, that effectively excluded a number of voters in those, in those particular states. In Alabama, we saw that not only did you have a photo identification car, a law that was enforced, but Alabama also closed down DMVs in the Alabama Black Belt that affected at least 250,000 people in that particular region who typically would have went to the DMV for a new photo identification card. So you saw essentially a, an intersection of not just photo ID laws in many states, but also photo ID laws were combined with other tactics that were used to suppress the vote. We've also seen voter purges. Um, and really, quite frankly, the voter purges that have gone on in states since Shelby V. Holder have been more devastating from my perspective than the photo identification laws. Historically, all jurisdictions have had voter purge laws. They've been necessary to remove dead people from the rolls, people who move from one jurisdiction to another, 
And they were used to scrub people oftentimes who maybe had a uh, conviction that essentially uh, prevented them from voting. The problem is that the most recent laws have been tightened and oftentimes don't account for the errors. Some states have passed voter purge laws that scrub people from the rolls if they have not voted in the last two November elections. In Texas, at least 360,000 voters were purged since the Shelby case, have been purged since the Shelby decision. 1.5 million people in Georgia were purged from the voter rolls between 2012 and 2016. In Alabama, this number is 780,000 people who have been purged. Overall, at least 17 million people have been purged from the voter rolls between 2016 and 2018. So overall, we've seen a wave of voter restrictions, including the closure of polling places, restrictions on early voting and other measures, um, restrictions on third party uh, voter registration groups, um, the, the elimination of voter registration locations, the, the elimination of souls to the polls to mobilize individuals to go to churches. Um, the elimination, as you as, as you probably familiar with the local news, with, with the national news, with mail-in balloting procedures that have been in place in states for, for years. So overall, or in, in general, these voter restrictions have been most dramatic in those post-Shelby, in those Shelby, in those, re, those pre clearance states that the, the Shelby County uh, v. Holder case essentially had it, it impacted. And this is a, another story that is, some of you may be following. A month ago, lawmakers in Georgia introduced legislation seriously curtailing the use of absentee drop boxes that the State Election Board of Georgia approved at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is another example of the backlash that occurred to the November 2020 election and the Senate special election races in Georgia as well. And the Georgia election, the Georgia state legislature is deliberating this law right now as we speak. The Fulton County Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce has come out against that law um, as well, as well as some other corporations. Finally, what I, what I wanna state um, is that criminal justice is also a battleground for contemporary voting rights and the debate over voter suppression. At stake are the millions of formerly incarcerated, incarcerated persons who are disenfranchised, many of whom have served their time and are on parole and on probation. I know quite a few folks who committed crimes when they're 18 years old and served their time and now have essentially the equivalent of a lifetime ban on their ability to exercise their vote. In Florida, Amendment 4 passed by a 60% margin in Florida. 60% of the voters passed Amendment 4 in 2018, restoring the right to vote for quote unquote non-serious or non-violent offenders. This impacted 1.5 million prospective voters in Florida, an estimated 750,000 were expected to vote in the 2020 elections. The governors of Kentucky and Virginia have recently expanded voting rights to formerly incarcerated persons, totaling a combined 300,000 people, and formerly incarcerated persons in Louisiana recently pushed the state legislature to restore the vote to 36 formerly incarcerated persons. Tennessee adopted a voter registration bill in 2007 that enfranchises most incarcerated persons. However, those who have committed the most severe capital offenses are ineligible and to be able to vote, you must often pay fines, fees, and legal obligations in order to be in order to vote. As a consequence in Tennessee, just among those individuals who have committed quote unquote non-serious offenses, that is non-capital offenses, there's an estimated 450,000 prospective voters who can't vote in Tennessee because of legal obligations, because of fines, because of fees and other kinds of procedures in which the only way to deal with them or to address them is to go deep into the submerged state and to pay for those fines, to address those fines in county clerk's office, local election commissions, and also district attorney's office. The victory in Florida in 2018 is the most telling in terms of voter suppression. Activists won one of the most important victories that, that in, 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 in recent history when it comes to voting rights. It brought 1.5 million people back into the voting booth, a disproportionate number of whom were African-American, Latino, and, and, and poor folks. Yet immediately the Florida legislature passed a law mandating that fines and fees and even civil liens must be paid for in order to vote. Um, and the circuit, the, the Court of Appeals weighed in on this particular case. Um, I know the attorneys who worked that case and the Court of Appeals, when they weighed in, not only did they, side, did they decide essentially in favor of the Florida State Legislature, but they issued a, a decision that is so confusing that it actually has caused more problems for people who want to get their rights restored in this particular state of Florida. And I want to just mention the Florida case just briefly and how it pertains to Tennessee. 
Tennessee was tracking at the same time that the Florida case, the Florida issue was tracking. And when the Florida legislature made this decision to essentially prevent people from voting unless they pay their fines, fees, and legal obligations, again, affecting nearly 1 million people, the Tennessee legislature pulled this bill effectively. Tennessee had a bill that was approved by, I believe, one chamber on its way to being approved. All the voting rights activists thought that the voter restoration bill that would deal with those 400,000 plus people in Tennessee would have been passed. It was a bipartisan coalition, interestingly enough. Um, and, and once the Florida legislature made its move to stop the Florida formerly incarcerated person from voting, Tennessee essentially backed away from it, just to give you an idea of the kind of the spillover effect that occurs. So what do we go from here? Um, well, what do we go from here in terms of is we have to, we're in a long-term fight to deal with voter suppression. Fortunately, there is a consortium of voting rights and civil rights groups that are, that are working on voting rights litigation and other kinds of litigations as well. And this is a, a list of groups that are doing some great work. Again, I do work with the LDF. I do work with the Lawyers Committee. In the past, I've done work with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. I just did a case with the Southern Poverty Law Center last, last summer. And this is a list of some of just a sample list of some of the cases that are being determined, uh, adjudicated by some of these voting rights firms. And what the voting rights groups are doing is something interesting for our, our, our constitutional nerds out there is oftentimes, at least most recently, the voting rights groups really are not trying to bring uh, cases in the courts based upon Voting Rights Act violations out of the fear that the Voting Rights Act could be further undermined by the courts. But the, what they are doing is they're finding legal entry points. And, and really one of the more successful legal entry points point is the 14th Amendment. So if you look at some of those cases, the one here in Tennessee that dealt with the attack on voter registration groups, the one in North Carolina, the NHP versus McCrory case in 2014, these are all really 14th Amendment cases and First Amendment cases that these civil rights groups are bringing in the courts. Protests do matter, I wanna emphasize this point. They do matter in terms of shaping the conversation about voting rights, um, especially if the protests are strategic. They may not lead to immediate changes, but protests can educate the public, they can bring media scrutiny, and they can help recruit new activists. And I'm gonna refer get back again to the NACP versus McCrory case at the top of the screen in which leading up to that particular case were protests that essentially allowed in many respects lawmakers to overreach in responding to the protest. And in doing that, it also, it also allowed for the public to be educated regarding, um, regarding these, these protests. What you, what's also effective is, and I worked on this in Tennessee, our election protection and voter access coalitions have been emerging, particularly among students. We saw in Clark Atlantic University, Howard University here in Tennessee, there's been some election protection networks that on election day, triage concerns around elections and concerns around voter access um, that have been particularly effective um, when it comes to protecting the right to vote. So, um, and then finally, what I'll say is that I think what's important to point out is that um, voter justice groups, voting rights groups must, must be very uh, uh, vigilant about reframing voting rights in intersectional terms. Uh, if voting rights does not take place in isolation, but it's intersectional. It intersects with technology access. It intersects with public health. Um, it intersects with disability rights, disaster planning, Hurricane Katrina, the, uh, the, the North Nashville flood, uh, I mean, the, 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 rather the tornado in Nashville last year occurred right before election day. day. Um, uh, housing injustice, when it comes to the impact of foreclosures and displacement and gentrification, all these issues affect fair and equal access to the right to the ballot box and they affect representation. And so I think what you find voting rights activists doing is often reframing voting rights in intersectional terms. Finally, in closing, um, I wanna make this, I wanna emphasize that voter suppression is alive and well. It often operates in the submerged state. It often operates through what's called face neutral procedures or racial neutral procedures, but it's, it is alive and well and it is alive and well in the South. And as the South becomes more diverse, voter suppression will also continue to exist. The challenge is addressing both the overt forms of voter suppression that we saw in Fayette County and Haywood County in 1960, but also to address the less overt or face neutral forms of voter suppression um, that are less likely to land 
on the front pages of the newspaper that often operate below the surface and yes, operates in what's known as the submerged state. And what I wanna conclude with this is a quote by John Lewis, um, who uh, has a bill that Congress is considering named after him. And what he says is ours is not the struggle of one day, one week or one year. Ours is not the struggle of one judicial appointment or one presidential term. Ours effectively is a struggle of a lifetime and many lifetimes. And what he's saying is that this right to vote, voter access, voter justice is, is not gonna be resolved overnight, but it is a lifelong struggle that we must be committed to in order to um, effectively resolve. So I'll stop there. I thank you for inviting me and I appreciate um, the Honors College for hosting this. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. Students, uh, any any questions or, or comments for our speaker today? What are the kind of like requirements for working at a polling place in Tennessee? Are they very restrictive rules? Well, if you want to become a, a precinct, or what's called, if you're actually working the election, quote unquote, that is if you're actually at the booth taking, taking, um, you know, verifying registration, you, you do have to be a, uh, essentially an, an official um, uh, supervised by the local election commission. So you do need quote unquote training for that. You do need to be a so-called a, 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 an election precinct worker. Um, there's other categories too as well. Um, there's what's called uh, poll monitors um, and often uh, what's called, um, and there's another category that allows individuals to monitor elections outside, outside of the polling location. So there are basically like three categories of individuals who can be involved in so-called supervising elections. There could be actually ballot workers, precinct workers, who are verifying registration status, who are taking you to the booth to register. You can, as a, as a third party group, and I say third, I'm not talking about political party, but as a third party organization, you can request access to monitoring what goes on inside of the, of the voting booth, but you cannot talk to a voter. If you have a dispute, if you feel that there is a, an irregularity, you have to make that communication to the head of the supervisory the supervisor that's in charge at that time. And then that third, that third, group, that third group of folks are individuals who oftentimes can work outside of the precincts and they also, um, also um, um, can monitor elections too as well. But those first two categories, I believe you must submit your name officially to the local election commission. The first category is someone who actually is an official precinct worker. Yes, I've actually done this. Yeah. I've done. I've gone through the process. I couldn't actually do it on election day because of uh, COVID stuff or whatever. Yeah. 